Great. Um, so we are live and welcome everyone to Blogging Theology. And um, it's my immense um, pleasure and privilege today to have Dr. James Tabor uh, join uh, me to uh, discuss his work, which I'll introduce in a second. But um, I just wanted to say James Tabor is a professor of Christian origins and ancient Judaism at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte in the United States. His PhD is from the, United, uh, from the University of Chicago, and he's previously taught at the University of Notre Dame, or Notre Dame, as we say in England, and the University and at the College of William and Mary. Uh, he's combined his work on ancient texts with extensive fieldwork in archaeology in Israel and Jordan. And since 2008, he has been co director of the acclaimed Mount Zion excavation in Jerusalem and been involved in half a dozen other archaeological projects in the Holy Land over the past 30 years. Uh, in the early 90s, he was involved in the release of the unpublished, at that time, Dead Sea Scrolls. and was one of the first scholars to examine and publish several very important ones. Uh, in 1995, he testified before the US Congress on the Waco tragedy, uh, drawing on his expertise in understanding ancient biblical apocalyptic ideas. He has written numerous books and publications, and I won't list them all, we'll be here all night, um, but uh, his most uh, recent and forthcoming book is entitled The Lost Mary from the Mother, from the Jewish Mother of Jesus to the Virgin Mother of God. Uh, a wonderful title. Is that uh, due to be published this year, do you think, uh, James? We're not sure. It's been ready. It was actually scheduled for March of uh, this year. And uh, because of COVID, and also our political situation here. Um, mm. Almost all the major books coming out are on have been on politics, on Trumpism, mm. on the election, and our divided country, and so forth. So, the publisher is expecting this book to get a lot of media attention, and it, they felt that it was almost impossible to get on the major shows. Right. When I published the Jesus Dynasty in 2006, I was on Nightline. I don't know if you know that mm. over there. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. In 2020 and Good Morning America, and we, wow. you know, did some major interviews. And they see this book as also a kind of a groundbreaking book. There's, there's actually never been a book that I know of on a quest for the historical Mary. Uh, which is an interesting idea. Do we even have enough to do that? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm not sure when they're going to bring it out. It's been right. waiting for the publisher to decide. So right, right. it well, hasn't been announced yet. So I would think spring 2022 probably. Right. Because they usually need a, a few months ramp up for a new book. So. Mm. Well, I, I, I am looking forward to it, and uh, having read a couple of your other uh, works, I'm, I'm sure it'll be a, a compelling reading. As you, you have, um, it's not, um, it's not intended to be flattery. I, I mean, I, I've read a few books, and I must say, your writing style and uh, is is very compelling. You, you have a, a, a talent clearly for coming up with some extraordinary turns of phrase and crafting a a very interesting and uh, uh, you know a sentence or a, a paragraph. So, and and uh, academics are not always known, shall we say, for their stimulating narrative, but you, you, you certainly are. Um, the, the two books are of yours that I've read, uh, which I've just finished, uh, Paul and Jesus, the, uh, How the Apostle Transformed Christianity. You can see a very provocative title, you know, How He Transformed Christianity. And, and this one that you've already mentioned, The Jesus Dynasty, um, stunning new evidence about the hidden history of Jesus. And this has some very interesting um, discussions which we'll hopefully come to in a second about the early church and James and Jesus and a few other people. Um, so if, if I may just uh, perhaps introduce... So let me mention before you go to that, um, this is just out so people might be interested. It's another book on Paul. It's called Paul's Ascent to Paradise. I don't know if you can see. That. Yeah, yeah. Paul's Ascent to Paradise. Yeah, I can see that. Yes. It, my dissertation way back at Chicago was on Paul's Ascent to Paradise, and this is shaped out of that. Mm -hmm. But this is after, what, 40 years of reflecting on Paul. So it's my newest book on Paul. 
Um, it's more <laughs> academic, still, I think, pretty yeah. accessible. But you're right about the Jesus dynasty and Paul and Jesus. Those are Simon and Schuster trade books. They're attend. We usually say they're for the educated non-specialist. Mm. Is sort of the term the publishers use. Uh, but uh, I find that. So if, I'm not writing to my colleagues per se, yeah. as so many books within New Testament studies. But I'm I'm writing for the public. So. Oh yes. No, I, I can see that, and that's why y your books. I, it, it, you share something in common, like uh, with, with Bart Ehrman, I think, Professor Bart Ehrman, who's not a million miles from where you are. I think, in that's in, right. uh, um, in, in writing books, not just uh, for fellow colleagues and academia, also for the general, the educated general public. Very successfully, you both seem to have uh, broken into that market big time uh, over the years. And uh, are you part of the same university, or are you actually a different university entirely? Yeah, Bart is at Chapel Hill, which is about two hours from here right. in the triangle near Duke and North Carolina oh. state. Um, and Charlotte is of course the largest urban center in North Carolina. Right. And we were Bart's uh, Chapel Hill is much older. 1789. I think it was yeah, formed. It's the, like, one know. of the oldest public universities in America. Okay. So they've got some history on us. We were, <laughs> formed in 1946, but we're a large urban university with a really thriving uh, Department mm. of Religious Studies. Indeed. Really glad to be here. I like being at a large state school. It's, I yeah. like my students. I like the variety and diversity of the students. So it doesn't have any kind of seminary atmosphere. Right. And so I'm able to teach uh, broad courses on religious studies and what is religion and what is history and how do we investigate things and so forth? Oh, very interesting. Well, you have an enviable job, I must say. Um, so if I could perhaps come to uh, a question um, that arises from a comment, you a fascinating comment, I think, you made uh, towards the end of the fourth chapter in your book, Paul and Jesus, which really struck me. And again, it kind of bears witness to your, your wordsmith ability. Uh, very, very, uh, very well written. You say, if we can resist making assumptions and pick up Paul's letters. Now, Paul, of course, is the author of many, many letters in the New Testament. If we can pick up his letters with fresh eyes, we will capture an amazing moment in time for which he is our only first-hand source. We will learn how Paul transformed the original Christianity into a new religion that claimed to abrogate and supersede the old by moving everything from earth to heaven. Now, that's an extraordinary statement. Uh, would, you, would you mind just unpacking that a bit, both in Paul's role in changing this uh, original Christianity and how he moved everything from this terrestrial plane to the heavenlies? Yes. Um, let me start with just the idea. There's a chapter that relates to this in the book called, I don't know if I use this title, but it's about reading the New Testament backwards. And the mm -hmm. idea would be that instead of opening up, as most readers do, probably start with Matthew if they don't have any other guidance, even though we most of us think Mark was first. But you have the impression that you're reading the beginning, you know, the beginning of the mm -hmm. movement, John the Baptist and Jesus. And if you do Luke or Matthew, the birth of Jesus, and then you're just going along, and because Luke also has Acts, then you get the history of the church. Mm -hmm. And as you well know, it should probably be called the Acts of Paul and a couple of things about the apostles rather than the Acts of the apostles. Yeah. So Paul immediately comes on the scene as the main force, and then you go into Paul's letters, Romans and so forth. And Romans hits you first, and that's a treatise in a very developed way, probably Paul's most mature theological presentation of his gospel, as he calls it. And you have the idea that this is, that you're just following along chronologically. And so what I try to emphasize, and remember this is for general readers, I think my colleagues are well aware of this, but my students certainly aren't, mm -hmm. is, uh, it's, it's better to think, what do we first know about the movement? What's the earliest thing that we know? And that would be Paul's letter to, we call it uh, Thessalonians, uh, mm -hmm. the Christ, little cell group, the little Christian group at Thessalonica. 
And that would be our first glimpse. Uh, and then uh, we can go on through Paul's letters. Of, there are 13 letters with Paul's name. Most scholars limit their serious consideration of Paul, let's call it the core Paul, to seven of those letters. So the Corinthian correspondence, Philippians, even uh, Philemon gets in the one page to the slave owner, Onesimus, and so forth. So uh, uh, the idea of that statement is that we're capturing something in the letters that is actually earlier and more formative in terms of the movement uh, as far as a witness so that when we come to the Gospels, it could well be, and I try to argue this, that the theology we're getting, the dominant theology that we're getting in Mark, certainly, and in Luke, uh, to some degree paralleled in John, and Matthew is a kind of derivative of Mark, is, is very much uh, a version of Paul. And so to get back at John the Baptist or Jesus, we have to do this thing that we scholars have been talking about now, what, 150 years, uh, the so-called quest for the historical Jesus. What was Jesus of Nazareth as a human being actually like before Paul came along, uh, before Jesus became the Christ, as Paul uh, calls him? And so the fresh eyes that I want people to have is actually in a it's a, we're very privileged to have these seven letters uh, most of us think they're very few interpolations if any we're actually getting something firsthand mm -hmm. so if you want to study religious experience you want to study testimony sometimes people say well what do you know about james well i know we're going to talk about that the brother of jesus paul's our best witness because he actually mm -hmm. says i went and saw him and i visited him so imagine you're reading a letter by someone who actually met James, and he gives you firsthand testimony. Not that he tells us enough. We wish we had more. But by putting things together, we begin to form a mm -hmm. picture. So that statement is an attempt to say that the movement, as it originally started, was on earth, not in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, as the prayer Jesus taught his disciples says, let your will be done on earth, not in heaven, or as it is in heaven, rather. Uh, it was coming very much out of the Hebrew prophets, particularly Isaiah 2, Isaiah 11, uh, these messianic prophecies about the last days when the mountain of the Lord's house will be established, all the nations will flow to it. The nations will learn the one God, uh, Yahweh or Jehovah, and uh, turn and be taught the Torah and so forth. Paul has a Paul certainly believed those texts and sometimes even alludes to them, but he has a more, I would argue, a more heavenly version of the of those texts. He's allegorizing them, as he clearly says sometimes. Like in Galatians, he said, Well, Jerusalem above is what we're interested in, not Jerusalem below. And that gets echoed even in books like the book of Hebrews, mm. uh, you know, where you go through this whole history and then you talk about. We have not come to a mountain that can be touched, Sinai. Also, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, where, you know, Moses, that was a certain glory, but that's now faded because now we have a heavenly glory. And it can sound almost like Plato, but it's not. And I try to explain mm -hmm. that because when Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, we look to the things that are unseen, not the things that are seen. For the things that are unseen are eternal, and the things that are seen are temporal. That could be in the Phaedo. That could be in the Yeah, It's basically dualistic, Hellenistic, Platonic yeah. philosophy. Exactly. And so if Jesus and James and John the Baptist had a different understanding of the kingdom of God, not so much that there's no, you know, miracles or divine intervention or great things happening but it's on earth rather in rather than in heaven where paul begins to develop this idea of uh it, I, I think it's his greatest idea actually his greatest the, it's the greatest idea in paul 
not making a judgment on whether it's great, but it's the greatest idea in Paul, is that God actually created the material world, this is Romans 8, as a kind of a more uh, a physical, more uh, mortal, perishing mock-up, you might say, like Adam one of the dust. And the purpose of that is as a prototype to create this new genus of heavenly beings, right. the first of whom is Jesus of Nazareth. So the earth is almost like a, uh, a womb for these sons of God, these children, we should say children of God, because it's not really gender uh, identified, the offspring of God that are going to be, and Jesus is the firstborn of many. So just that whole heavenly perspective, not so much in a locative sense, like you have to go somewhere to get to heaven and leave the earth, but literally the dissolving of what is seen so that what is unseen can remain. And it is really what Christianity finally settles on. I mean, if you ask the average person, as you well know, uh, you know, what's your Christian hope? They probably wouldn't even mention resurrection of the dead uh, unless you prompted them. They would probably say, uh, well, when I die, even the apocalyptic is gone. When I die, yeah, yeah. Uh, that'll be my end, and I hope I face the judgment and I get I go to heaven, at least in America. That's the phrase you hear. Uh, are you absolutely sure that when you die, you will go to heaven because yes. there will be this judgment and so forth? So now Paul is not all the way down that pike, you know, completely throwing off all of his Jewish vocabulary and concepts. Of course, he still has resurrection of the dead. We can talk about that as we go on. But we have to ask, in what kind of a body do they come? as he was asked by the Corinthians. Mm. And it turns out that he can't even tell you what kind of body it is. But it obviously is not two arms, two legs, and a face like we have now, because he says it'll be as different as, a, say, an acorn from an oak tree. Mm. I tell my students, say, a uh, cocoon or caterpillar and a butterfly. It, yeah. It's transformation. He actually uses yeah. the word metamorphosis. So, Paul, now, I don't want to give the impression, Paul, your name is Paul, <laughs> uh, that Paul has invented something new. These are currents within Judaism. Judaism is already thoroughly Hellenized in many, many ways. And by Hellenized, I don't mean just picking up Greek customs and having mm -hmm. some Greek art in your mm -hmm. home, but it's already beginning. You can see it in Josephus. Uh, uh, he, he, when he talks about the immortal soul and the, the changing of the ages, it can sound almost apocalyptic, but it's really closer to Plato than, say, the Hebrew Bible. Whereas the Hebrew Bible is, uh, the, the picture that you get is uh, Israel has been scattered to the nations. They're going to get gathered. They're going to be gathered back. Yep. And Jerusalem will become a kind of spiritual center of the world. And there'll be a new temple that'll be a house of prayer for all people, as Jesus said to last week of his life. And uh, Herodian temple is going to go. And whether there would be sacrifices or not, uh, I'm thinking Jesus is probably leaning more towards what the Ebionites later said, that you know the sacrifices were temporary accommodations to human sin and weakness and so forth. But that the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, what am I quoting there? Isaiah 11, which is the Messianic chapter in the entire Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. Uh, a root will come forth from the stump of Jesse, David's father, talking about the Davidic Messiah. And if you just ask, what is the Davidic Messiah going to do? The things that he's going to do are not the things that Paul lays out in Romans 1 through 8. Now, we can talk about 9. I know many of your listeners know the Bible. I don't want to just, you know, call these signals out like flashcards. But, you know, 9, 10, and 11, he does address the situation with yeah. what he calls Israel according to the flesh. But he's very keen on saying we don't know Jesus any longer according to the flesh. Yes. Even if we once knew him. Well, who once knew him according to the flesh? Peter. 
James. James, you see. And so he, I think he's proposing a new system. Uh, I think it enables Christianity to survive in a certain way that it probably wouldn't have otherwise. The Ebionites didn't do too well. No. Apocalyptic has a, a 100% failure rate so far. I tell yes. my students, uh, there's this great quote from Rowley, you know, H.H. H. Rowley, in, during World War II where he's talking about Hitler and all the apocalypticism around uh, the things happening in Britain with the war with Germany. And he says, I, I, he's warning his readers. Uh, it's his famous book called The Relevance of Apocalyptic. I, I really recommend it. It's written in the, I think during the war he wrote it. And he said, I don't have much hope that these predictions of, you know, kind of a dispensationalist antichrist and, all of these uh, final battles are going to come about any more than they have in the past when people have predicted no, such no. things. So Paul, in a way, can skirt all of that because in a moment, in the blink of an eye at the last trump, the physical becomes imperishable and everything gets transformed. And he actually says that the earth was created, this is Romans 8, in, he, the English is in futility. In other words, it's, it's uh, Ecclesiastes. It's, it's, I guess, this law of thermodynamics. Everything runs down. Everything's mortal. Everything's corrupt. Everything's, it, it's not becoming something. It's declining into some sort of stasis. And he says that's the way God made the world. It wasn't just a chance. It, it's not by chance that it's that way. But rather... It's a plan. Plan A, have the physical world in which moral issues are tested by human beings outside the gates of Eden, these atoms that are of the dust, and those who are justified or are called justified, saved, reconciled, and finally glorified will then be part of this transformed cosmos. So things that might concern people in Paul's day, like uh, should we get circumcised or how should we keep the Sabbath or what he calls in, uh, I think it's uh, Colossians, touch not, taste not, handle not, that are all, he says, rules and regulations of the flesh. Mm. He's characterizing his Judaism. But um, that's very interesting, but uh, there's several, so many things. I want to talk about the resurrection, yeah. Jesus' resurrection, and how, uh, uh, but also about Jesus and the law and Jesus' own religion, his own practice of faith. But uh, I, perhaps I'm going I'm to go with the resurrection question because um, uh, I think that's slightly more um, uh, interesting. Well, not more interesting, but it's, it's what your theory as to uh, what really happened is very, very interesting. I think viewers will find it interesting. You, you rightly say that Paul's letters are the earliest first person eyewitness accounts we have the very first in the entire new testament of the resurrected jesus because paul himself claims to have seen the resurrected jesus and the way he describes the 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 body uh the, the physicality of it is very interesting but but what the point one of the points you make about this is that paul as he as he himself says is the last in a series of recipients of a vision or an appearance shall we say of the risen Jesus that was given to James and the 500 and Peter and so on. And last of all, as if to one untimely born, Paul says, he appeared to me. Now, what that appearance consisted of, you, you do discuss in some detail. And that, that part of the book actually is becoming, is quite scholarly, I think. I'm not behind the rest of it, it's not scholarly, but you are moving in a more academic uh, direction there. I, I get this, the, the feeling, your, your analysis of concepts and words and philosophy and so on. But to, to, to me, as a layman, it struck me if the if the road to Damascus vision is is what we're we're talking about here in in one of the three accounts in Acts that we read of this vision given to Paul of the resurrected Jesus, the people with him in one of those accounts saw nothing. They heard a voice, but they didn't see anything. Um, and could it be? And I think you suggested it is that Paul essentially had a vision, a religious vision. Lots of people have visions. There are Catholics who see the Virgin Mary. There are people who see other religious figures throughout history and all sorts of religions. 
But that is, and this is the first eyewitness account, person, first person testimony we have of the resurrected Jesus is essentially a vision, I, I would think. But what does this tell us about the later Gospels, in particularly, say, in Luke or John, where we have a very physical, uh, bodily, uh, three dimensional um, Jesus, resurrected Jesus, who eats food, who someone could put his finger in his side and see, look, touch me here in John. Um, I think you, you seem to suggest you have a, a development or an embellishment or, or um, of um, of the story from an earlier vision like um, encounter with the risen Jesus to a, a more physicalized, uh, perhaps more like a resuscitated corpse encounter compared to the very spiritual heavenly uh, encounter that Paul describes in the chronologically much earlier first person account. Uh, am, am I being crude but fair to you so far in your? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's so important to, to note that, that it goes in with the first question that you ask, uh, where do you start? Do you start by reading, um, probably Luke is the most developed as you said, it mentions eating some fish and, and and John, of course, Thomas touching him and so forth, and also eating. You start with those accounts. If you do, and that's certainly what people think of Easter morning, yeah. is this empty tomb and a resuscitated corpse. That to Paul would not be resurrection mm. in the sense that he means resurrection. Resurrection mm. for Paul is transformation from a person, from a, a dust being, an atom of dust, which we all are right now. We are breathing nefesh in Hebrew, uh, breathers, living breathers, literally, same as the animals. Uh, and we die, we go back to the dust. So the transformation is from that level of being to this transformed glorious being. There's an immortal and powerful, and, and really the glory is, is the main word that he uses. Mm. So it, it's far from resuscitating a corpse. Now, whether Paul thought that it would be some, it, it could be compatible with the empty tomb uh, in this sense, that uh, you almost need uh, CGI filmmakers to picture this, but uh, since he pictures resurrection as, all that are in the tombs come forth and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we who are alive shall be changed. That's the word metamorphosis, metamorpho. So the dead come forth from the state of being dead. Their bodies are gone. Their bodies are gone to the dust. We're not looking for atoms. We're not trying to find any body parts. Somebody could be cremated. Even the book of Revelation talks about the sea gave up the dead that are in it. We're not talking about finding corpses. Uh, even scientifically, we know that's that's an absurdity. You know, once someone is deteriorated enough, they're just gone. And so Paul's idea is no, the essential you, though, comes forth, but it's reclothed. Uh, he understands the state of death. He calls it in 2 Corinthians 5, a very important passage on this. He says, uh, we're li living in a tent, the body of the, the tent. That's actually an image of Plato also. Yeah, yeah. So true. you are not the body. It's dualistic in that sense. You're in your tent. And then he switches to clothing. You know, Paul does this all the time. He uses two metaphors and mixes them. So you're in a tent. And then you're in these old clothes. You take mm. off your clothes, you get out of your tent, and you're tentless or naked, as the case may be. And then you get reclothed, new set of clothes, new body, or a permanent building rather than a tent. So he actually has two analogies going at once and they kind of cross. But the interesting thing is he said, if we lose the old clothing, the body, our hope is not to be found naked, but to be reclothed or even further clothed, it can be translated. Mm. That's the new, new existence. And so it could be, if we picture an empty Herodian tomb, and uh, I've been in many of them, and you know, I describe in the Jesus dynasty these tombs, and laying on the niche 
which is called the arcosolium, where the body's laid uh, and decayed. It's wrapped in a shroud and so forth. And uh, I think I start my book by talking about uh, actually finding the only shrouded uh, remains of a first century person ever discovered uh, with Shimon Gibson, just hiking in the Valley of Venom with our students one day. And by chance, we come across a freshly robbed grave that ended up dating back to the first century. And some mm -hmm. of the shroud was even left. So this is very vivid to me. So I'm picturing the body in the niche and I, this is how I'm imagining Paul would see it, that suddenly there'd be some sort of energy field in the tomb and whatever is left of that physical body would just get, it would just sort of melt or transmogify, is that a word? It would just sort of, you know, and all that would be left would be some residue of clothing or something. And you would go like, "Where? what happened? Where is he? But not a, not a corpse getting up and walking out and it's the same physical state that it was in before. I think that's how Paul would view it. So Paul, I don't, you know, everybody says Bart would say this, Crossan would say this. I know you've interviewed uh, Dom as well. Uh, they would say, well, the empty tomb is later. I'm not completely sure of that, uh, how you explain it. You know, I guess you could just, hmm. Believe what Paul says that Jesus that Jesus was raised from the dead, but resurrection is more apotheosis, uh, which is a, a big word, but it essentially means being divinized, yeah. being taken up into the heavenly world. And yeah. the way you can really see this in Paul, you know how everyone says First Corinthians fifteen is the resurrection chapter. No, mm -hmm. it's not. It's not the resurrection chapter. The resurrection is a subsidiary question. If we're going to have this great transformation, what about the dead? Did they get to, because they're, they're going to miss it. First Thessalonians, same thing. What about the dead? Don't worry about it. They also will experience the same, even though they've died. But it's the transformation that is the topic. So the chat. If we wanted to put a title on that chapter, which it's not necessary we do, but we do this sort of topical thing, it would be called the transfer, the, the revealing of the new atoms, A-D-A-M-S, the new Adamic race. And these are these transformed spirit beings. He said the first man, Adam, was a man of dust. He actually quotes Genesis 2, verse 6. Mm, yeah. Quotes it. The second man, Adam, is a life-giving spirit. The transformed spirit. Now, why body? Well, for Paul, body is your mode of being. You're not just this essence that effuses through the universe or even in some kind of interim state, but you actually are awakened. His metaphor is sleep. You're awakened to this new empowered existence that is far beyond anything that uh, could ever be the case in in this material world well what what strikes me about the uh resurrection encounters um well perhaps i should qualify that there is what i perhaps irreverently call the zombie apocalypse at the end of matthew's gospel where yeah, yeah. at the time of jesus uh death you get uh, an un an un no number a large number of people coming out of their graves actually this is this is resuscitated this is bodily resurrection resuscitation style and walking around jerusalem and returning to their families um but that that apart that those two verses those two solitary verses which have no other attestation in history as far as we're not in josephus or the gospels or anywhere else so parking those on one side what what what, what strikes me about these resurrection appearances in the early christian tradition is that they only ever happen to disciples Christians already, disciples of Jesus, they don't happen to anyone else. They don't happen to Pilate or or a, a, any non-Christians. So it's already that the true believers are receiving this, this, this visionary experience. Mm -hmm. And that, that strikes me as interesting and slightly suspicious because if it was a corporeal resuscitation kind of uh, event that Luke has us, uh, that Luke portrays, then why couldn't it have occurred to other people as well? And why, ha why hasn't their testimony been preserved? You know, passers-by or people who, you know, people in the Sanhedrin or, or, or some of the Pharisees. Wow, some of the Pharisees or the Sadducees, they also saw him. But no, none of this testimony exists, it seems. And even according to Matthew in Matthew 28, 
uh, as, as you mentioned, some of them, some of the, the inner circle who did see him, some of them doubted. It's an amazing statement. It's an amazing so, statement. It's an amazing statement. So, so, you know, not only is it just the inner group, but even some of the inner group didn't believe it after they had seen Jesus, that it was Jesus. So it, it seems very kind of, not neighborless, but very kind of tentative. And I, I would expect it to be more public and more widespread and more convincing if it was, as, say, Luke portrays it, as this corporeal, physicalist resurrection narrative. Wait, as opposed you know, to in one of the chapters in Paul and Jesus, I lay out, as you mentioned, in some detail, the way I would see that developing. Um, in other words, let me put it together for you the way I think it might have happened uh, chronologically. That the earliest experience, the one Paul's talking about, mm. was akin to uh, some combination maybe of seeing a light or seeing a manifestation of glory but also a presence, an incredible presence. Yes. Uh, and it was indescribable, but it was indisputable to these people. It was essentially saying, though he is dead, he, he's actually alive. And it's echoed a little bit in the book of Acts, like Acts 9 and so forth, in these three accounts of Paul, where he's blinded. And uh, the problem with that for people is they say, oh, so you're saying it was just in their head. But see, that's that's not how to view it. Like, if you tell me a spiritual experience you had or even something that seemed fairly corporal, like uh, people talk about seeing a person that's died and then they seem to just appear and then disappear. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's in your head or not. Uh, most skeptics would say it is, but do we know all the mysteries of the universe? And that's why Paul says whether it was in the body or out of the body, mm -hmm. talk about my other book here, Paul's Ascent to Paradise. In the body, out of the body, I don't know, but I know what I experienced. And it does seem to involve a voice, mm -hmm. at least in the accounts that we have. Even in Paul's account in Second Corinthians, the Ascent to Paradise, He's told by Jesus when he comes back from that experience, he actually gets a verbal communication uh, because he, he has this messenger of Satan that is buffeting him, and he, he asks Jesus to remove it. So he has this conversational relationship with Jesus. But this is with the heavenly Christ actually talking to him and hearing back. And so I think that was the early experience. I would expect that Peter, I'm, I'm going by the gospel of Peter here, uh, they stayed for the days of unleavened bread. That's eight days. They didn't see anything. It's uh, Peter, the gospel of Peter, it's very fantastic in a way and more unbelievable in terms of wonders than even our canonical gospels. But there's a section of it where it says, we wept and cried for seven days. Why would you be weeping and crying if you're meeting with Jesus regularly and having meals with him? You wouldn't. And then Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. And that's where it breaks off. So I think they went back to the Galilee in despair, great despair. And then Peter and James and the others, the, the way Paul recounts it, they begin to have these experiences that are overwhelming of, a, of, a, of the presence of faith that God has, in fact, raised Jesus from the dead. I don't know if the body's gone or if the body's there and they don't care about the body. It would be like taking Paul's analogy. You're out of your old clothing. You've got your new clothing. And you say, well, I, I want to carry this old clothing with me wherever I go. Why, well, why do you want it? The old. So like Crossan has said, I could picture Christians visiting the tomb of Jesus with some kind of corpse inside, I know people can't imagine this, and saying, this is testimony to the resurrection because he's left his tent behind. He doesn't need that tent in heaven. Does he need organs? Does he need his lungs and stomach? Is he, is he respirating? Is his heart? This is nothing to do with the glorified new Adam that sits at the right hand of God in power and glory. That's what Paul saw. I think that was their view. Remember when James, the only thing we have of James, uh, where he's asked, and of course it's later, it's in, in some of the uh, Hegesippus and 
hinted at in the pseudo Clementines, these later writings. Mm -hmm. But when James is asked by the high priest, tell the people not to believe in your brother. And he mm -hmm. says, you'll see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. So here's James saying, and he calls him, he doesn't mention him a lot, but he does call him the Lord mm. twice, uh, the Lord Jesus uh, in, in the letter of James. So that would be my idea. Now, the Gospels later, for apologetic reasons, in, in my opinion, begin to embellish so that Mark has no appearances. Why? Because Mark's resurrection faith is the transfiguration. The transfiguration was a prolipsis of the resurrection. If you want to know resurrection, it's in Mark 9, 1. You'll see the kingdom of God come with power. Some of you standing here will not taste of death till you've seen the kingdom. And then it says in seven days later, they go up to a mountain, just like Matthew 28, and they see this, we call it transfiguration. Well, that's a good word, transfiguration. You're transfigured into this. So, so it was a foretaste. I think Mark is telling you uh, the last words we get from the messenger in Mark, and remember, it's not an angel. It says a young man is in the tomb. Mm. You will see him in Galilee as he said. Now, what does that mean? We're going to sit around a campfire with him? And No, you'll see him in Galilee as he said, mm. going back to Mark 9. In other words, he's the glorified Christ now. So that's Mark, and then you go to Matthew, and he's got uh, two appearances. And as you mentioned, one of them is very misty, up on a mountain. You kind of picture clouds wafting by, and they're going, uh, is that him? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so it's maybe remembering, a, maybe they went back to the very mountain. It's called in Mark a high mountain. I picture them maybe going back to that mountain. It's odd that Mark, that Matthew would have it on a mountain. Notice Mark and Matthew are Galilee, not Jerusalem. People pointed out that for years, right? Mm. They're supposed to go to Galilee. Go to Galilee and you will see him as he said. So they go up to Galilee and they have these experiences. Paul is much later, seven, eight years, a decade, probably seven years later. He too has such an experience. Now, I'm not going to psycho, you know, psychoanalyze that and say he was guilt ridden and he was this and that. And, you know, who knows why people have experiences, but he had the experience. He goes to the others, apparently, and they're terrified of him. And he says, no, I've I've seen it. I've seen him, too. And I even heard him. And I think they accept that Paul also has because look at his behavior. It completely changes mm. that. uh uh, well, then you get our last two accounts, and they're much later. I mean, that's not a coincidence. They're much later, and that would be Luke and John. And now we're getting people, not Celsus, but the Celsus type, you know, the second century skeptic. Come on now. what You know, you had a vision, but people always have visions. What is it? You know, was it really something you could prove? And now they try to do both because Jesus still ascends, still takes off, so to speak, you know, into the other world. But before that, he's got to concretely show, no, it's really me. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is strictly for apologetic purposes. No, in fact, I argue, and I think it's in Paul and Jesus, uh, that the best account of the tomb being visited is the first 10 verses only of John 20. And if you read just the first 10 verses, it is absolutely the most natural account. Mary Magdalene goes early. She's alone. She gets to the tomb. It's empty. The stone is already rolled back. Somebody's taken the body. There's a gardener. And she goes, where have they taken him? And, uh, and then she runs away afraid. And then the other two come and, witness that the tomb is empty and so forth. Uh, but uh, these other accounts like John 21 and even the latter part of John 20, I think that's more to show that uh, now the, the, the corpse needs to also be walking around. In some ways you're combining the two. Mm -hmm. When my students read this, they always say, well, 
didn't he walk through the locked doors and then it seems like he just sort of disappears. So isn't it kind of like an epiphany maybe like you have in the Hebrew Bible where a, 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 an angel will appear and eat a meal and then kind of, I think, is it with Gideon where they make him some cakes and, and then he touches the fire with the stick and it says he just goes up in the flame, you know, just sort of disappears to the other realm. So maybe they were thinking of it more like that, that it's not so much that the corpse is walking around, but that the risen Jesus manifests himself in a physical way so that they could believe and then resumes his spiritual, what we call it, we call it epiphany, right? Uh, I think that's the technical. In your view, that's still an embellishment, his development on the earlier um, highly heavenly uh, vision. I think it is, yeah. um, mm. So that, that's interesting. Well, let's think, can I just change tack? If sure, I sure. To, um, James and Jesus. And so on. I'm just going to try out a theory with you. Uh, you may not agree with it, but it strikes me that... Um, there's quite good evidence now that the historical Jesus um, was a Torah observant Jew that, uh, and this is just my opinion for what it's worth, and that he didn't come to found a new religion called Christianity, let alone Catholicism or evangelicalism, right. um, that he was in a sense bringing a, I don't know, a message of spiritual renewal within Judaism, uh, a renewed emphasis on Torah ob observance and obedience according to the teaching of Jesus, like we see in the Sermon on the Mount. So it's not just more of the same. It's a particular emphasis on certain values, certain spiritual interiorization. Rather Absolutely. Mere, Based on the Hebrew prophets, primarily. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Rather mere externality, which, of course, Jesus excoriates mm -hmm. many, many times. So we, the religion of Jesus um, is, is basically Judaism, but understood in a particular way according to the teaching of Jesus. Yes, he, there are strong hints that he was the Messiah. Yes, he was a prophet of God, an eschatological prophet. So he had a, an apocalyptic vision uh, uh, of the end and so on. Um, and then moving, uh, we see that, perhaps, I would say, most clearly in the Gospel of Matthew, the first Gospel, where there's huge emphasis, it seems, uh, not just in the Sermon on the Mount, but also Matthew 23, the verse four, uh, first four verses of that in Matthew 23, 23, and also other places where Torah observance is central to J Jesus' program for um, eternal life, for living in the kingdom, uh, as, he, as he says in Matthew, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. And I, I see that as more authentically the, the historical Jesus than, say, Paul's account, which is, as, uh, sorry, than John's account, I beg your pardon, where Jesus himself as the son uh, in a, his relationship to the father is more the, 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 the message of that gospel. So we're coming back to Paul, though. With Paul, though, we seem to have a religion about Jesus. So Jesus becomes the center of his gospel. He proclaims Jesus as Lord and the proclaimer has become the proclaimed. Uh, and the kingdom of God that Jesus preached has become the church. It's become this, or, or as you as you see it, the heavenly, the heavenly beings who are uh, tr transfigured in a heavenly way. But it, it seems you get this: the, the tradition, if I can call it that, the Jesus tradition has miscarried. That you you, you leave behind the synoptic Jesus, particularly the Matthean one, it, uh, and it's miscarried, and you have a kind of different religion centered on a heavenly Christ where the Torah is no longer, the, the, the written Torah, the Mosaic Torah, is no longer central to obedience to God as it is for a Jew, of course, because it's a covenant that God made with Israel, you know, with, with Moses on Mount Sinai. This is no longer the center of day-to-day -day obedience. It is walking in faith according to the Spirit, having faith in this heavenly Christ. So is it not possible, and I, and I kind of sympathize with the view, to see this as actually a, a miscarry of the tradition, it's a new religion, the gospel of Jesus has become the gospel about Jesus. And yes, there are continuities. Yes, they both both talk about the God of Israel. They, they both talk about uh, uh, judgment and, and, and so on. They're not pagan, but it is nevertheless a, a new species. The evolution uh, has evolved into a new being. And it's not just simply an embryonic development. You mentioned the acorn and the oak tree. It's not simply that metaphor. It's a it's a different species entirely, if I could put it that way. Uh, How would you respond to that kind of um, back of the postcard characterization? Yeah. <laughs> I think I would I would generally agree with what you said. Um, 
the problem is language in some ways because there's not a monolithic thing called Judaism. There, there's great diversity. True. And with that Judaism, if, if I'm Jewish and I'm a Jew and I put myself under the what was called the yoke of the Torah, mm -hmm. according to Jesus, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Whereas the sect that he runs uh, against mostly in the Gospels, the, the Pharisees, and uh, I won't go into that now, but as you know, they probably don't get a full uh, and, and sympathetic treatment. No. But at least in all forms of Judaism, from Qumran to the Sadducees to the Pharisees, there is also this halakhic interpretation of the Torah. So it's not just simply you taking the Ten Commandments or the Shema about loving God with all your heart, loving your neighbor as yourself, and kind of pulling together some ethical principles. Uh, it is, you know, a religion with practices, with festivals, with holidays, with the, temp the Temple Mount being the center and the mm. place of focus. I, I think Jesus is absolutely tied to all of that. Yeah. Uh, he wears the seat seat. I have some here because I show my students. They have no idea what they are. And I got these from one of my Jewish friends to show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Jesus has one of these, yeah. whether well, it looked exactly like this, but these are the blue cords. It says I yeah, the, 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 robe, right. Yeah. It says I'm an observant Jew. But the question is, so is Amos, so is Hosea, so is yeah. Jeremiah. Jeremiah is really the model in many ways for Jesus. And Jesus says things like, go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Yeah. Go learn what it means. Or the Sabbath is made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. That sort of thing. And as you said, internalization. Now, that's fully Judaism, and mm. the, there is within Judaism. Hillel, for example, mm. seems to have the reputation, although he's from the school of the Pharisees. We don't know great detail about this, but we get hints in the Mishnah and some of the early writings mm. that he seemed to take an approach somewhat like Jesus. Yeah. You don't jettison the Sinai revelation. You yeah. don't jettison the chosen people of God. You don't jettison the the covenant you don't yeah. call it the old obsolete old as an obsolete yeah there's no old covenant there's the covenant there's yeah. only one covenant uh and so anything about a new covenant not in the jeremiah sense we all know if you read it in context jeremiah 31 31 is about a new covenant as israel comes back to the land and renews its vows it's almost like a couple that renews their wedding vows but it's, this is a really important point, James, because it, it says in Jeremiah 31, as you're, you're saying, that, it, we, Christians often, uh, evangelicals, for example, often say, well, look, this is the new covenant now that Paul's talking of. But if you actually read Jeremiah 31, 31, uh, Jeremiah talks about the law bitten, being written on people's hearts. But yeah. wait, the law is still operating. The Torah is still operational. Exactly. Yeah. You're being followed. It's not being abolished or abrogated or anything at all. So as you say, it is an internal is Israelite uh, renewal of a covenant. Right. It's not a new covenant in terms of a new species of covenant where, uh, well, in, in the Pauline sense. Uh, well, Paul the, also said that, I mean, Moses said that you put the Torah on your heart as well. Yeah. So this is not a new idea. It's a renewal. It's it's a yeah. kind of restoration of the spirituality yeah. that should be in the Torah exactly. that many Jews today uh, would would affirm and say that Judaism is really about your relationship to God. It's very personal. Yes. And these other ways of expression are ways of uh, understanding Judaism. Now, there then is also the idea, you don't have to be Jewish, uh, in, in, in the first century or today, yeah. all forms of Judaism accept that what's the phrase in the Mishnah is the righteous of all nations have a place in the world to come. Yeah. So you have the God fears. We know them in the New Testament. We have the centurion where Jesus says, I haven't found faith like this in all of Israel. Mm -hmm. We have Cornelius who fears God daily and gives alms and so forth. These are not kind of uh, Jewish wannabes, these are human beings, yeah. fully accepted, who've turned to the one God 
And this is how Paul sees his converts. So he doesn't want them to convert to Judaism. Uh, certainly not if they think that's an added thing they need to do in order to have a relationship with God. But people now read that, which is a very particular problem in Galatians, as if that's the new faith. No, he was addressing a problem, a very simple problem. If I have given myself to the one God of Israel, I've repented of my sins, I've accepted Jesus as the Messiah, I've been baptized, I've received the Holy Spirit. Am I... Is my relationship good? Well, read Romans 1 through 6 or Romans through 8. Yes, your relationship is good. Do I need to add on that the observances of the Torah? And I think Paul's particularly worried because he was a Pharisee, from all we can tell. They're not just going to add on, here's a Bible, go read it and maybe interpret it and you can kind of be a Jew. Uh, they're going to give you every little detail of how to interpret for, and the Sabbath is probably the best example. Okay, I'm going to rest every seventh day because it's one of the Ten Commandments. And then the rabbi is going to say, well, what is rest and what is work? Yeah. And we have 39 categories that we have designated as work. If you go out to Qumran, they would consider the Pharisees as liberal. They're even more conservative about ritual purity and all kinds of things. And so uh, Jesus has within that variety of the very strictest, I don't know if you've ever read the Dead Sea Scroll text, they, they call it MMT. It's Ma'aseha uh, Torah, some, some deeds of the Torah, and it's a very strict interpretation of, of different regulations about purity. And it basically says the guys up in Jerusalem, they're too lax on this, and so they're under the wrath of God. Yeah. Now, it's not like Jesus is a Reformed Jew, but because that wouldn't be a good parallel with 1920s uh, 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 because they've kind of thrown off, you know, they've accepted Spinoza and biblical criticism. It's a completely different liberalism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it is a liberalism in the prophetic sense. Look at the heart. Look at the internal, not the external. Ask the intent of things. For example, divorce. Perfect example. Mm. From the beginning, it was not so. Yes, Moses allowed it. It's accommodation to your own failure. But what would be the ideal? Why not live the ideal? The kingdom of God should be the ideal. And Paul picks that up. He picks it up. He says, well, if two Christians are married, even if they have a horrible time getting along, they can separate. But don't divorce. This I say, not I, but the Lord. Why? Because you're supposed to have the ideal. So he had this ideal. It's actually not an easy way. He says, my yoke is easy, but, you know, he's actually, uh, if you even uh, curse your brother, you're already guilty of murder. So it's would say, well, I've never killed anybody. Well, maybe you've killed their reputation, you know, by saying lies about them. You're going to have to account for it. So it's actually a pretty tough way. You know, my way is as tough as well as narrow. But it's fully Judaism, and the Gentiles can come along and, and also be included. Mm. They don't have to convert to Judaism as a religion. So it is a kind of a universal Torah faith, I would call it maybe, or an Abrahamic faith. But it's yeah. for all human beings. And the covenant people, the Jewish people, mm. are carrying the torch. They're kind of out front carrying the mm. torch. And now the Messiah, you know, has sort of picked up that torch as, as the leader of the pack. And the rest of the world is supposed to be drawn to that. Mm. And then you got to throw on your apocalypticism as well, because it's, it's yeah. this is all going to be wound up pretty quickly. So, but you well, well, yes, and of course that didn't didn't happen. But um, it, it strikes me. I think you you, you mentioned this, and you and you argue this very persuasively in your in your in your work that James, particularly James, as head of the church in Jerusalem, the to use anachronistic language, the first pope, not Peter, but James was the head of the church in Jerusalem, um, was famously a Torah observant Jew of a quite strict kind, arguably, if Josephus, the Jewish historian, is to be believed and other and other sources as well. And um, th there is this, uh, despite Luke's Acts, his book of Acts, which prevents a very irenic, um, harmonious picture of the early church where Basically, everyone gets along. Paul's a Torah observant Jew, it seems. Uh, Paul's own letters betray a very different um, experience where 
men come from James, he says in Galatians, to sort out Peter, basically, who's doing what he shouldn't do, and that he's, you know, he's having fellowship with these Gentiles. Uh, 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 and 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 Paul says about my gospel, my gospel, I received directly from the heavenly Christ. I didn't get it from any human source. I, I, I didn't get it from Peter or James. These those reputed or so-called pillars. I mean, the language is extraordinary. Uh, the way to talk about Jesus' own disciples, it seems really to be is. distancing himself. Yeah. I, I I still find it shocking. And he even says, "What they are means nothing to me." And it means nothing yeah. to me. I mean, I remember a Catholic friend, a very educated, I, I, I met him at university where we were studying theology together, a Roman Catholic. He said, Paul is the original Catholic theologian. And I, and even then, I, I, mean, I know what he meant, but I thought Galatians is not Paul being Catholic. He said, what these people mean, I, the apostles, means nothing to me. That's not a very Catholic thing to say, is it? You know, no, it's not, not a Catholic thing. To they're say. not a very collegiate. We're all together. We're all the apostolic college, basically. In together, in this together. On the contrary, he is he's distancing himself and asserting his independence from them. Yeah. And the gospel he received is not is directly from this uh, heavenly Christ. And it's, it's ongoing. ongoing. It's ongoing, day yes, by day. Yes. You mentioned that. They're very important. It, it is on on. Yeah, I don't know that they are, and this is reflected, as you know, in the Ebionite material and in the Clementines in the second century, where the argument is. Should I go by someone who's had a vision, or should I go by the original apostles that were with the earthly Jesus? And Paul makes it very clear who you should go with. Hmm. And Second Corinthians is really important in this. Now, as you know, I don't know if you finished the book, but the the toughest chapter in the book, and I guess on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I think I was right, and on Tuesday, Thursday, I wonder if I was wrong in the weekends, I don't know, but the is uh, I go with uh, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, which is just completely verboten in the field, but I really thought it through. I think Paul made a break toward the end with the other apostles, and it probably was over. In the book of Acts, they come, as, as you know, to an agreement that Gentiles do not need to observe the Torah. But Jews certainly do. Exactly. That's very clear in the book exactly. of Acts. Exactly. And yet, as you said, we know from Paul, his mode of operating, as we call it, his MO is to the Jew, I became as a Jew. To those under the law, I became as under the law, not actually under the law. Yeah. But uh, under the law of Christ, he calls it, or actually, it's under the law to Christ. Those without the law, I became as without the law. So that I think he considers all of that as obsolete, but remember, he, it, it is passing away. It hasn't passed yet. So you've got to work in the interim, as Schweitzer mm -hmm. said, interim ethics, not only apocalyptic, but you're still within Judaism. Women should veil, uh, or they should have long hair. They should uh, follow Jewish traditions. We don't want to cause a scandal. But on the other hand, there's neither male, female, Jew, Greek, bond, or free in Christ. So, yes, stay a slave, but, you know, really, you're not a slave because very soon it's all going to be. So he has yes. such a – it's all going to be removed. So he has such a heavenly vision that, that the last thing he would want is for any of his precious flock to be put under the bondage, the thumb of these people that would want to rule over them. You know, and say, well, let me teach you all the laws of Judaism, and here's how we interpret them. And now, you know, we even know it from modern Orthodox Judaism. If you're inside, it's not necessarily considered a burden if you've grown up with it. But if you're outside, it can be quite a challenge. In fact, mm -hmm. rabbis say today, if you consider converting to Orthodox, uh, you probably should move if you're in a rural area where there's not a community around because you, you really can't do it on your own. There's just too much. You know, yeah. where are you going to get your meat? Where are you going to get your bread? Where you, There's just so much to consider. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think, Paul, I think the word gets out that he actually thinks the whole thing is mm. moot, as we say. Yes. I picture that if someone came to him privately and said, look, Paul, I've been thinking about this. Mm. I'm Jewish. 
And, you know, I, I do observe most of it, but I'm just thinking that some of these things, especially the body, you know, what we eat and so forth, does it really matter? And I think Paul would say, you're not far from the kingdom. You know, I think he would, he would privately, but don't go out and don't rock all the boats, you know, in terms of uh, the stability. But, but later on, of course, in Mark's gospel, perhaps written in the 70s, I don't know when, I can't remember when you date it, yeah. you have an explicit uh, parenthetical comment in Mark chapter 7, where uh, the subject of uh, hand washing and cleaning on food cleans, mm -hmm. where, where Mark says, not Jesus, and thus he declared all foods uh, clean, you know, abrogating the kosher food laws, Mark does in the 70s. So this is taking what you think is implicit or slightly uh, secretive perhaps in, in Paul and making it much more open and attributing that to Jesus himself in uh, his ministry in, in Mark chapter 7 so yeah. and then uh, even more shocking and I, I still find this very shocking when you uh, and you mentioned this when you read Ignatius of Antioch's letters now he he was a, a bishop uh, in the early church he was martyred I think it was AD 107 or thereabouts and we have what are now considered to be authentic letters by him, a small number of those. But he says, you know, don't follow Judaism. Judaism has been Absolutely. abrogated. In, in fact, you know, it, it is a false religion, in, in effect. Now, this is something, you know, this guy is supposed to be the uh, carrying the mantle of the apostles and, and passing on the tr one true faith that comes ultimately from Jesus. And yet he has essentially anathematized the very religion of Jesus himself that he preached according to Matthew. Yeah. Matthew, I think that's very remarkable, uh, uh, actually, that if you compare Ignatius and Matthew, and these are probably contemporaries, more well, broadly speaking, contemporaries yeah. historically, the, the, the one anathemizes the very religion that, he ha that, that Matthew actually has Jesus right. uh, living and teaching, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Obey the law, he says, I think it's a Matthew 18, Matthew 17, 18, I can't remember, obey the law. Wow, I mean, that's the commandments, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obey the commandments. It's something that that's Ignatius, also in Mark, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, what must I do to have eternal life? Why do you call me good? There's no one good but God alone. Obey the commandments. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine Ignatius of Antioch mm -hmm. uh, uh, ever giving that answer to a question from a disciple. Or, or, yeah, let me complicate Mark 7 just a little for you, though, because that uh, parenthetical statement, thus he declared all foods clean, yeah. is actually not in the Greek. If you look at the Greek, what it says is, really? what comes into the mouth does not defile, but what comes out. And then right. he says, what goes into the mouth goes into the stomach and passes out into the toilet, basically, is what he's talking about. Yeah, Cleansing all food. That's, it doesn't say thus he declared, cleansing all food. Right. Uh, so I think it's actually uh, more of a joke in, in a certain way. Uh, remember, the issue was dipping dishes and all kinds of things in the mikvah mm -hmm. and eating with unwashed hands, where they've extended this ritual purity to the table. And Mark explains this in, in the first verses, that they... Mm -hmm. If if uh, th this this is plastic, this this would have to be dipped in the mikvah because it's not a stone vessel. This particular glass I'm holding here, if it had come in contact with any kind of ritual defilement, then I couldn't go to the temple. So uh, one way to read that, I think the implications are the same, is that it's not what you eat or any kind of uh, or uh, ritual defilement. You shouldn't be worried about if there's a contaminants on your hands. But as you know, when you wash your hands in Judaism, you're not really scrubbing your hands. You're symbolically yeah. Yeah. going to the clean, from the unclean to the clean. So it's a sort of ritual purity. But the joke part of it is it's sort of like a toilet joke. He's saying you're so worried about things, what you put in your mouths, and where do they really end up? Mm -hmm. What you should be worried about is something else that comes out of a person. And he's actually saying, not the bathroom. That'll take care of itself. There's the but in many names, I think it's like, is it 19 different things? I counted them once. Maybe it's 12, 13. Yeah. They, they become the sort of uh, 
it's a wonderful list really of like what were Jesus's ethics? Yeah. You know, what are the things that develop, defiles a person? But for, he, he says, for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, yeah. murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these things come from within and they defile a person. It that's is an right. extraordinary list. And that's good Judaism, by the way. That's good Judaism. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting. This, the NRSV, which uh, yeah. I, you know, is, uh, I understand, you know, many scholars prefer translation. Even that has, thus he declared. All yeah, it's pretty Jews. common. I, I, yeah. I think it's a, probably a misunderstanding of that, although the point maybe being made by Mark's community might be the same, that food and this sort of thing doesn't matter so much. Uh, but I'm not sure that that particular verse is about eating pork or shellfish being allowed. No, uh, in the Jewish context, of course, it would have been unthinkable. So it's literally it passes in the stomach and then out of the body, cleansing all food, meaning your body takes care of these physical things and even so-called ritual defilements. Um, because when people have a system of ritual cleanliness, it's hard for them to not think of it as something that's actually there, like a substantive thing that you, yeah. Yeah. you get rid of. So he's saying, well, whatever it is, it's in the toilet. So don't worry about that. Worry about this toilet. You know, your mouth, mainly all these evil things people say and so forth. But, but, but this antithesis, uh, like the antithesis of the Sermon on the Mount, if pushed too far, then they, they, they in a, almost an antinomian way, uh, can mm -hmm. lead to the abandonment of, the, of the, the commandments of the law itself. If there's such a, a spiritual interiorized emphasis on this personal yes. relationship and just the purity of intention, then someone's going to come along and say, well, we don't actually need even get this in Islam, where some extreme Sufis have abandoned the, the Sharia and abandoned mm -hmm. prayers five times a day. And, you know, they would drink wine and so on because, hey, it, it, this is the mere externality. It's the body. What really matters is my relationship with my Lord. Exactly. Yeah. And, and what, what one perhaps can see that in uh, early Christian uh, development, where Jesus' emphasis on purity of intention, niyat in Arabic, is very similar to... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, prophetic hadiths uh, in Bukhari uh, becomes then ultimately abandonment of the very uh, commandments in Sharia or Halakha itself in the name of the superiority of the interior over the exterior. Whereas I think, uh, it, well, just my personal view, there has to be a balance between the two. Otherwise, we're not all mystics and saints that can live on that high level. We, we, most of us need to have the constraint of law um, to keep us on the narrow path. Otherwise, we're just going to go all over the place. But then that's just my own personal view, but uh, it seems that may maybe maybe Jesus was interpreted in that way that led to that in Paul and ultimately the Catholic Church in that very spiritualized interpretation of law and abandoning the Torah, which Jesus hadn't done. And James, his brother, he obviously knew Jesus and the apostles knew him, hadn't abandoned the law either. Uh, and so maybe that's a way one can understand the trajectory of the religion. I think so. Yeah. And so Paul, uh, even in Romans 14, although he's not discussing, he doesn't literally talk about clean and unclean meat, but he does talk about uh, holy days and vegetarianism and meat offered to idols and so forth. And it's the same direction that you see yeah. in Mark 7. Uh, if these are, if you have these scruples, we certainly don't want to offend people or wound their conscience or whatever, or get them to do something that they're not ready to do. But basically God doesn't, you know, you have your own relationship with God. I think yeah. it's important to recognize the culture, just as it would be in Israel today, if you're particularly say you're in Jerusalem. I know Jerusalem also has Muslim and Christian population. But if you're in the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem uh, or you're around uh the Jewish side of Jerusalem, as I've been many times, there's a culture that's going on there that Gentiles can be fully a part of without being Jewish. And it really has to do with taking on a new sort of cultural identity. So the restaurants are going to be kosher anyway. So that's, that's solved. But as a Gentile, if you did want to eat pork or 
something of that nature, you would be allowed to, according to Judaism. But mm -hmm. you're in the culture where you'd have to go look for it, so to speak. And then also um, the holidays. You know, the Romans, the Greeks, they had all sorts of holidays, mainly built around the emperor or celebrating his birthday or certain events in Roman or Greek history or the birth of gods and so forth. Festivals all, every month there's a festival. Well, now you've turned to the God of Israel. So what are the festivals? Well, there's Passover, there's Shavuot, there's Sukkot, there's the three pilgrim festivals if you can't make it up to Jerusalem. Uh, so these are not burdens. They're, they're more just cultural structures that you would just swim within. It would be your water, so to speak. That's, yeah, that's yeah. It's your pond that you're in. So whether you're a Gentile or a Jew, but you wouldn't be obligated. The Sabbath would be a good example. It's Friday right here. It's Friday, uh, let's see, Jerusalem time. It's already sundown. And it's in my your time, it's already sundown. So we're, mm -hmm. we would all recognize as a culture, if all of Britain uh, basically on Friday began to shut down and you weren't, they're not going to get arrested if you keep your shop or a coffee shop open. But it, generally, things in Jerusalem, it's actually quite nice. You, you smell the bread, bread baking, and people come out with the children and so forth. So, mm. as a, I'm not Jewish, so as a non Jew, I've lived in Jerusalem. I'm, I'm part of that. I, I like that, you know. Uh, now, it's not exactly parallel because now we have Christianity and Islam as well. But imagine in the first century. Yeah. Now, Paul, uh, I don't think he would have any problem with, say, the Corinth. There is a synagogue at Corinth, and had they not kicked him out and rejected him and caused him trouble, he, according to Acts, he stayed there a year and a half. And, you know, he did initiate in the synagogue. Well, now they, they're a disenfranchised group, but they've turned from idols to serve the living God. So they're not going to go participate in these Roman cultural things. Very, very few anymore. Their cultural orientation is going to, he can talk about our father, Abraham. Oh yeah. Abraham. I'm, I'm, I'm re Maybe somebody had a copy of the Greeks, the Torah in Greek. I'm reading these texts, or maybe they had some of the prophets scrolls of some of the prophets in Greek, or maybe someone could even read Hebrew in the group. And they're beginning to learn this new culture, but it doesn't mean they've converted to Judaism. No, no. It's something that we've lost. So when people say, is he starting a new religion? Yes and no. He's not setting up Easter and Christmas and the mass and church buildings and all the accoutrements that we associate with Christianity today. No, he's not doing that. He's still Jewish. And if you saw him, you would think that, that guy's Jewish. You know, he would sound Jewish. He would seem Jewish. Maybe his accent, you know, would reflect uh, some sort of Jew, certainly his language. Uh, so always keep that in mind that it, we think of religion. And I think Israel is a good illustration today because most Israelis are secular. They really are. The majority are secular, although the Orthodox are catching up with babies. But yeah. so if it's Passover, you go home for Passover. What? Because you're you could be an atheist. Because mom is going to be cooking and the family's coming together. And this is when we remember when our people came out of Egypt. So, well, I don't believe all that fairy tale stuff. Try okay. staying away and see what mom says, you know? <laughs> so yeah. it's, you have to keep that in mind. And, yeah. but the bottom yeah, line, for me, Paul, is he thinks everything will be over. I tell my yeah. students, it's like if I'm teaching you in May, which I just finished a class on Paul. This is all going to be over by next summer. Yeah. Probably a year from now, two years yeah. at the most. It's all yeah. going to be over. Yeah. Because the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Caligula just tried to put his statue in the temple. The desolating sacrilege was almost carried out. If it got that close in the 40s, you know, and now Nero's on the throne and he seems a little bit deranged. So I think Paul is so sure that that it's all coming to an end that these he wants to protect his flock. But he's absolutely sure that when the parousia comes, when Christ appears in the heavens, his people will be fully OK. They're going to rise to meet Jesus as long as they've 
follow the moral. That what he's worried about is sexuality and drunkenness. And, you know, notice what he harps on all the time. Mm. You can't be a robber and a thief and a drunkard and a liar mm. because uh, the Lord is an avenger of these things, as I solemnly told you, First Thessalonians 4. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's the language is tricky because people always say to me, well, did Paul start a new religion? Not in that sense. No, he didn't start a new religion. But did Paul lay the foundational concepts that would become the bedrock of a new religion that would be in heaven more than on earth? Apocalypticism basically fades away within 100 years or so, after Bar Kokhba, certainly. And then it's like uh, we're... I guess we have the Montanists in the second century, but that's not, you know, that's just one movement in Asia. But essentially people uh, begin to think of themselves as in Ignatius, just like you said, Irenaeus, yeah. Ignatius. We got a new way now. Epistle of Barnabas is nasty. You're yeah. nasty. Ignatius is articulating a, a completely distinct and separate religion. Absolutely. Uh, and and he, he spent most of his life uh, in the first century. I, I know he lived to great old age, apparently, to his 80s and died in the early second century. But it wasn't that too distant that this new That's religion, right. yeah. this Gentile religion, as it was then a Gentile religion, it wasn't the Jewish faith anymore, was a, a consciously distinct and separate from uh, the parent faith. It, it really had... You know, the, the the child had divorced its parents in a, in a, in a way. If that and, and the destruction yeah. of the city of Jerusalem and the temple was yeah. huge. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know Brandon's book. Uh, let's see, what does he call it? Uh, the Fall of Jerusalem and the Christian Church. No, this is uh, the famous British scholar, Brandon, who wrote Jesus the Zealot. Anyway, he, he, he argues that we've forgotten what a watershed moment that was. Yeah. for everybody in the whole Mediterranean world yeah. Yeah. so that there's no, you know, essentially Israel scattered. All the leaders are dead. Peter's dead. James is dead. There's no, you know, we think John might have lived on, but we're not sure. Some of those, because there's apparently two Johns in Asia and we don't know which one, yeah. whether that's the Zebedee John or not. But uh, I think it's a really different world in the 80s, 90s, mm. into the second century. And uh, people are picking up the pieces. Yeah, that, that's when the, the rabbinic, Jude what we call rabbinic Judaism was born, but when the, the exactly. rabbinic, yep. rabbinic Jews gather together outside, you know, and, and petition for uh, a, a city where, you know, the Mishnah was ultimately codified. And, and you get the beginning of, of the Talmud and this whole sense of, you know, Talmud study rather than temple worship, kind of the center of gravity shifted to um, perhaps a more literary religion uh, exclusively than without the sacrificial system. And um, but I, I just wanted to move on lastly, if I may, to um, sure. your um, th this other book, the Jesus Dynasty, um, and the conclusion of that, which contains a, a fascinating um, observation and a fascinating claim. Um, if I'm just going to read it, just a few verses few verses, <laughs> a few sentences. You say uh, on page 287, Muslims do not worship Jesus, who is known as Isa in Arabic, nor do they consider him divine. But they do believe that he was a prophet or messenger of God, and he is called the Messiah in the Quran. However, by affirming Jesus as Messiah, they are attesting to his messianic message, not his mission as a heavenly Christ. There are some rather striking connections between the research I have presented in the Jesus dynasty and the traditional beliefs of Islam. Now, particularly in the West, to make any connection, I think, between Islam and Jesus is a radical claim, although it's not a radical for historians who know what they're talking about. But could you just uh, elaborate what these connections are that you have discovered between that research you had undertaken and the traditional beliefs of Islam, because I'm sure our viewers would be absolutely fascinated to hear about this. Yeah. As far as the way Islam eventually developed over the first hundred years, some of that is lost. But from what we know in the Arabian Peninsula, the Prophet Muhammad is being influenced by a form of Christianity 
that we today would probably know more as Judeo-Christianity. Uh, it's also known by the church fathers as the Ebionites. Mm. I like this little book. It's out of print. Well, it might have been reprinted by uh, Hans Joachim uh, Schoeps, S-C-H-O-E-P-S. Yeah, I've, heard of, I've, I've heard of it, yeah. It's a very nice little book. It's mm. only about 100 pages. And he deals with most of the sources for these uh, Judeo-Christians. Uh, but they are very monotheistic. They don't see Jesus as Yahweh or Jehovah or God in any way. Uh, they do think he's been exalted and is raised from the dead. They believe that. They think he had a human father. And um, now... Later, as, as Islam develops, and I'm not an expert enough to know how much Muhammad left some of this behind and began to modify it, but I have studied a bit. And apparently Muhammad even uh, advocated the Sabbath. And he was influenced, you know, to accept Jesus, to accept Abraham, to accept Moses, uh, all the prophets, uh, the holy books are the Torah, the Gospels, and the Quran. Even today, you see signs in Muslim countries. These are the scriptures, even though they say they've been polluted. And the Ebionites also said the scriptures have been polluted, they, that someone has sown tares. They like the Matthew passage, yeah. that those tares are like false teachings that, that Jewish groups had put into the scriptures, but that Jesus was a reformer and so forth. And so... There was, of course, you've got the rules, the dietary laws about pork and so forth that carry over, circumcision. So there, it, it's sort of a, a strange form of Judaism with Jesus added, but not as God, but mm -hmm. as the Messiah. And Muslims do believe that Esau, Jesus, will return mm -hmm. and defeat the Antichrist, which is very similar to what Christians say. Mm -hmm. And Jews usually don't use that sort of language, but in Daniel 11, where you do have this final evil ruler modeled after Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, he comes into Jerusalem and the Holy Land, and there's a great time of trouble that's unprecedented. It's paralleled in Jesus when he talks about the so-called synoptic apocalypse, Mark 13, and then the resurrection of the dead. So there's a sequence of events that Islam also has. It's mm -hmm. in the book of Daniel. It's in Mark 13. It's in the book of Revelation. The details vary. But essentially it is, uh, even in the book of Revel Revelation, uh, the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. See, So you've got the God and his anointed one. Mm. Allah and his prophet Muhammad or Jesus, his, his Messiah. So anointed comes to mean, uh, I mean, they do believe he's the Davidic Messiah and so forth. I don't think there's much of, if you think about some of the Messianic prophecies in the Hebrew Bible, they would be okay with those. Uh, you know, he's anointed, he's empowered by the spirit, he preaches good news and the truth and, you know, teaches people the way of God. So, so would you would you see that many of those early uh, Christian beliefs that were carried on by the Ebionites in the second century, would you see that that trajectory continuing then in some way, in perhaps a different form in Islam in the seventh century? In a different form, because all religions develop. And I think Islam develops from the time I'm talking about, where he turns his back on Jerusalem, he turns his back on the Jews who rejected him, he changes from the Sabbath to Friday, mm. so that when you make these kinds of changes, it uh, it, it causes a rupture. Yeah, and yeah. I think the change eventually is as much as uh, going from, say, second century Christianity to full blown Roman Catholicism. You know, where you have all kinds of uh, traditions and additions and so forth. I do want to say because of, in America at least, there's so much ignorance about Islam. People who say that Allah is not God, uh, I'm sure you 
you, it's you know, it's you know, it's important to point, point this out to our students that you know El Elohim Eloha Allah Al these are all words for God which means the force the power El the force of all forces Elohim it's this, it's the entity who cannot be named. So actually, Allah is not the name of God. Yahweh is not even the name of God. When Moses asks, what is your name? He says, I will be what I will be. Yeah. How, how are you going to name pure being becoming and unfolding? What would you call that? No, just... You know, it's the sum total of everything. As the, as the rabbis say, Hashem is Hashem, the nameless one, yeah. the name. It is not a name. It's a beautiful yeah. idea. So Allah is not... Oh, Allah is the Muslim God. No, it's not the Muslim God. Allah is the concept of the force of all forces, the creator, the God, the ultimate power. When people say, well, I don't know if I believe in God, but I think there's ultimately something. You just named the Jewish God. <laughs> you just named the Jewish God. So you're not quite an atheist. Uh, you got to say there's nothing. There's atoms. This is Jacques Monod. There's atoms and the void. That's it. There's space and there's the physical elements of the four spiritual, four physical laws that we know of. And that's it. There's no other reality beyond that. If you're willing to say that, I guess you could be an atheist. But if you say, I think ultimately there's some ground of our being or whatever, you're, you've just jumped into the camp. You just jumped into theology without realizing course, it. Yeah. And so, there are very few people actually that are complete materialists because it, it doesn't even make sense since Einstein showed us that matter is actually energy. Yeah. How could you be a complete materialist? You just said I'm a complete energist. <laughs> you know, so. There was a survey done um, by several universities in Britain a year or two ago, I discovered, and they, they asked self-identified, self-described atheists in many countries around the world, Japan, uh, Europe, South America, and so on. Um, what they believed, did they? Be, uh, and and the majority of self-called uh, designated atheists believed in the supernatural, the supernatural being defined as either life after death or, or angels and so on. Most self-identified atheists are clearly not materialists if they believe in the supernatural. Now, obviously, a minority did uh, do yeah. what, what perhaps materialists in that uh, out-of-date sense that Einstein wouldn't have agreed with. But uh, but um, you see, even atheists, most of them are not. Materialists, they do believe in the supernatural, according to the research, which is an extraordinary finding. When so I some of my friends that are atheists, they use that term. They would say, "Look, I think there might be something, but I don't think we could ever know what it is." And it would be like an ant trying to comprehend everything going on right now in in the human sphere, all the complexity. And but they're not saying. Mm -hmm. that they've comprehended the entire universe and have declared it to have no meaning or significance. No, no, it's kind of agnostic humility in a way. We just don't yeah. know. Uh, so the, my, my last question to you, if I may, do, given your knowledge as a, as a professor of religions, do you think Muhammad was a prophet of God? Well, I, I guess I don't fit into those kinds of categories in terms of questions, even if you ask me, what do you think? Jesus was the Messiah, or do you, you know, even God, uh, or the, the the Jewish God? I I try to stay descriptive. Um, I wouldn't find a way to answer that from the standpoint of the academic study of religion, because it would take on a sort of uh, a theological stance uh, from which I would affirm that meaning. This is a prophet. This is a prophet. This is a prophet. And yes, Muhammad would be. Uh, so it doesn't. Uh, I guess I would answer it and address it in a different way. Probably not answer it, but address it in a different way. Is that uh, Muhammad seems to me to represent, even with the traditions of the five times the prayer and all the things you've got to quote do as a Muslim that are different from Jews, different from Christians. But in its essence, it seems to represent an Abrahamic faith that has some degree of purity that uh, other forms and expressions of Judaism and Christianity lack. 
And that is, for example, Judaism in many, many ways, uh, I don't know how you do a percentage on it, but has adopted a kind of Kabbalistic mysticism that is really closer to Gnosticism mm. than, you know, a simple Hebrew Bible kind of reading of the ancient Israelite faith. It has, you know, spheres within spheres and reincarnation and mortal soul and the Kabbalistic uh, tree of being and so forth. So that's that's very different from, from Moses. the prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. So the prophet Muhammad, when you read the Quran, I read the Quran, I'm sure you have too. By the way, I recommend this translation here very highly. I think I have it handy. Uh, Arthur Droge is oh. a colleague of mine. Uh, oh, oh, I've, I've not seen that before. Let's see if I can get it to focus, maybe. There. Yeah, I, uh, AJ Droge. Yeah, DR. It's yeah. uh, what he did is, it, you know how people see. I tran I'm, I'm translate. You know, I'm also translating uh, things here and there, but I published a translation of Genesis recently, wow. and it's very similar to this. I always have students who say, you know, I'm teaching the Bible, usually the New Testament. I'll say, well, the original doesn't really say that. It, it's actually this, like the thing in Mark seven. You know, it doesn't actually say that. And, of course, they always say, well, why isn't there a translation that has what you're telling us it says? I said, well, I guess that would be claiming to have the perfect translation. But there is a method of being more literal, I guess you could call it, or careful with words. And particularly if a word is used numerous times in a corpus like this, so what Droz does, and you can look on Amazon and see the page. You can see all those notes there. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. all of the terms. It, 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 he, he tries to be pretty consistent that whatever terms of the Quran are used, their footnotes, oh, this is the term for this, and it's used 60 times, and it right. you know, conveys this idea and that idea. So you're actually, it would be like a Quran study Bible, but a good one. You know, not no expositions of being a Muslim or teach this or that, just a historical critical reading of the Quran in terms of what it says in, in Arabic. I'll say, say and, and that's the one I've read it uh, really carefully. And I will say this about it. And, and back to your question is Muhammad a prophet. He does get a much clearer vision of what Moses and Jesus were all about at the heart of things than the developed religions of probably all three, meaning Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, meaning right. it's a man, Abraham, walking in faith with the one God, walk mm. before me, you know, leave your country, leave your land, on a mission to establish moral order in the world and to bring people back to God and so forth. That is, in that sense, uh, and not adding anything to that God. Mm, mm. The basic moral standards are just about identical. Yeah. In our political and radical situation today, it's hard for people to realize because they think of Islamic Jihad and they think of, you know, Sharia law being imposed on people and we behead people and so forth. Um, but... Uh, so some people won't like me saying this, but I think if you think about what are the core elements of the faith, a, a really strong view of the one God, that God has messengers and prophets that are sent through history, mm -hmm. that the people of God are the Jewish people, which Muhammad said, they're the chosen people, mm -hmm. their mission, which they failed in, according to Muhammad and the prophets, mm -hmm was to bring light to the nations. And now we've got this one last chance and here's the light and so forth. As you know, when you read the Quran itself, it doesn't come across, like if all you had was a Quran, you wouldn't know it was a religion called Islam really. Because Islam just yeah. means to submit to God, right? And it, doesn't, it doesn't claim to be, as you say yourself, but it doesn't claim to be a new religion. No. Claims to restate, reaffirm the old time religion of Abraham. So, if, if it did have novelty, then it would undermine its own. Abraham, Moses, the prophets, and Jesus. 
Yeah. So can, can I just press you on that, if I may, James? If I was to ask you, do you believe Moses is a prophet of God? Presumably you would also give the same answer, that you couldn't say that Moses was a prophet of God? Yeah, because I don't really – I have my views, and if you track me enough, you probably find some of them here and there. Um, I do identify personally – pretty much with the, I, I would call it more the Hebrew faith, some version of the Hebrew faith. But I, I am quite fond of Jesus, obviously. Uh, I, I would find it difficult to leave him out of the picture. And so uh, the kind of thing I've forged together would be uh, sort of emphasis on the one God Moses and the Sinai revelation and Jesus as uh, the one sent like many of the prophets to uh, sum it all up. But it wouldn't be, I wouldn't go with uh, particularly the Christology of Paul, the soteriology of Paul, you know, the atonement kinds of things that he gets into that he thinks are so central. So, uh, you know Romans pretty well, I'm sure, but Romans 2 is actually Paul without the Christology, <laughs> Romans 1 and 2, particularly chapter 2, mm. so that God will judge those who know the law by the law, by the Torah, and those who don't, quote, know the Torah, he'll judge by the Torah written in the heart. That's just mm. good basic Judaism. Mm -hmm. And he'll give to every person according to his deeds and so forth. And then Paul kind of sets that chapter up. And then the hammer blows in chapter three. But none of us have done that. So we're all condemned. And so we need Christ in the blood of Christ. Yes, yes. And I say to my students, what would a rabbi say to Paul? You know, we, we dialogue this in class. They read it. And I said, what would a rabbi? Would they just go, oh, you shut my mouth. I have nothing to say. Yeah, I guess I'll say <laughs> Christ. Yeah, right. I said, Let me tell you what a rabbi would say. The rabbi would say, well, Paul, you were exactly right in Romans 2. Uh, now, whether God will judge the thoughts and intents of the heart by Jesus or not, you know, that would be according to whether he's the Messiah. But let's just bracket that for a minute. As far as what you're arguing, none righteous, no, not one. That's absolutely the case. And what do we do about that? Psalm 51. What did David do? Have mercy on me, O God, according mm -hmm. to your steadfast love. Brought out my transgress and so forth. In other words, you turn to God as a father pities his children, so mm -hmm. the Lord pities those you know who fear him and so forth. All the wonderful passages about forgiveness and grace. So Judaism is not a religion of law, it's a religion of grace. It's completely misrepresented by Christian mm -hmm. misreadings of Paul, as you know. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to see that that little part of Paul is preserving something more Abrahamic mm -hmm. that James picks up on in his chapter one and two about the show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my works, you know, this old conundrum. But notice James doesn't say anything about the blood of Jesus, does no, he? No, no, he doesn't. And Jesus, when he, my favorite story in Luke uh, is, I think it's Luke 18, two men went up to the temple to pray. One is a sinner, a public and a tax collector. The other is a Pharisee. And he won't even raise his head. And he says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And this is Jesus then, Luke, has Jesus say, and I tell you, that man went up justified. justified for God. Exactly. You just use the word justified. You can't say justified according to Romans 3 because we all be justified. Well, how did he go up justified? Oh, the blood flowed backward. And so they get into all these things. That's what, that's what they do say. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, you know, the point is, um, I, I, could, uh, I understand uh, Isaiah 53 in a different way mm. that I think is closer to how Jesus understood it. And that is... All, all followers are called to be part of the suffering servant group. And many of, not all Israel is Israel, and 
Many people that were the name Israel are not even remotely trying to follow God. But if you do follow God, you're going to get crushed. You're going to get, mm-hmm. that's what he said. If anyone would come after me. So I, it's hard for me to take labels because the label would be so uh, off base in trying to communicate what I'm saying. Yes. But I think I, I, Jesus I, I, was I the man I, I, in whom, I'm a theist yeah. and, and I'm a, I'm of Abrahamic faith, and I think Jesus is the man in whom God was well pleased. Uh, I see Jesus uh, just anthropomorphically. I'm thinking God is saying, "Finally, somebody's really getting this right." You know, uh, this is this is it. I think Hosea was that way. I think Amos was. From what we can tell, they yeah. they got it. It's like you get it or you don't get it. And if you think religion is just a bunch of uh, lists of rules and so forth, and it's more external than internal, you don't get it. But Moses got it. You know, put this law in your heart. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm-hmm. Love your neighbor as yourself. So so uh, somewhere in there, but I don't know what the label would be. No, I, I think in an American context for yourself, to say you you know identified Muhammad as a prophet would carry so much cultural explosive uh, connotations it would be very difficult to say that it wouldn't be understood as a as a, a affirmation of abrahamic faith in that in its purity and integrity it would be taken as the religion of islam today yeah yeah, which, yeah. and in the same way that if i said i'm a christian that would be the religion of christianity today yes and yes. if i said i'm a jew it'd be the religion of judaism yeah and then you got to ask what kind of judaism what kind of christianity what kind of islam yeah. But there is a thread, you know, the Christians talk about a scarlet thread. I don't know what color this thread. Let's call it a golden thread. There's a golden thread running through all the way, and it has to do with what I think we all know instinctively in our hearts anyway, mm-hmm. and that is uh, what Paul's saying in Romans 1 and 2, that we, we sense within ourselves uh, that we're moral beings, that we're responsible for our behavior, no one can escape that. And that whatever comes beyond death, we're in the hands of, you know, for, forces and powers that seem to have some sort of benevolence, yeah. despite human failure and evil. I think we all sense the incredible good as well within within our experiences. So, so I'm probably much more... Um, but I know what you would call that. So I like the word Hebrew a lot. <laughs> well, why not Abrahamist? Or maybe that's not. Yeah, Abraham. that would be good. I I wrote a book actually called Restoring Abrahamic Faith, but it's yeah, a, it's kind of a I'm generic. Revising, I'm revising it now it? Uh, to try to be more. I, I left too many things open for people to misunderstand because they think, oh, so Tabor's kind of Jewish, right? <laughs> so, you know, you read that. Yeah. Because there's so much about Jesus being Jewish, and you think, yeah. well, I'm just... many non-Jews who try to go to the synagogue, they get very disappointed, especially Christians that are used to studying the Bible, because that's not, I mean, you read the Torah, and you read the prophet readings, and so forth, but it it's not a church Bible study group, you know? yeah. and I've had people go there, I went to the synagogue, and the rabbi, and I wanted to study, you know, this and that, and the scriptures, and so that that's not really what they mm. I didn't get the feeling that uh, I would fit in too well because it's more it's a culture as well it's a whole culture and an ethnic group and so well, a lot of Jews now are, are fascinated of course by the Talmud on online studies of, of the yeah. Talmud and that that seems to be where it is obviously that incorporates the the written Bible but uh, uh that, that seems to be the spiritual and uh, identifying focus now of many millions of Jews it is the daily study you know, the, the daf yomi the idea of the, the daily yeah. Uh, which I follow myself. It's quite quite fun. Do you? Okay. Well, good yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah. It's quite fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't yeah, always understand. I don't I've always understand. Here. I, I do. I do tend to follow it. <laughs> yeah, I did Barakot once, uh, just you know, going through that that first track tape, just so I would know what it was. And, mm-hmm. no, so, a gold mine. Well, I'm amazed that you do that. Yeah. Now, well, are you? Are we asking personal questions? Are you from a Christian? background I, I i used to be for sure i used to yeah. uh when i was at college i converted to catholicism but uh 
uh, a few years after that, I encountered Islam. So that, that has been my path since then. Um, ah, okay. uh, so, uh, yeah, but I, I'm reacquainting myself with uh, Judaism from a Jewish point of view rather than um, any other point of view. So the Talmud, of course, is the central Sure. Uh, occupation now uh, and and that's a fascinating area of study so i'm very interested in judaism on its own terms understood by their own scholars their own scholars rabbis sages and whatnot very interesting mm -hmm. so um unless there's anything else i, I um we've been chatting uh for one hour 50 minutes i think according to my yeah um, no i think uh, i've enjoyed it and i appreciate okay. the openness of it all. I will just clarify uh, on these questions at the end. My my dilemma, like any professor of religious studies, is I never want to come to the classroom uh, and, and my books in some way are the same way, my academic books, even my popular academic books, uh, as I tell the students, we, we want to study and try to understand religions and their founders and their movements and how they developed it as objectively as possible. Mm. So I wouldn't want to take a course in Islam, for example, where the professor came in and started the class by saying, in the name of Allah, the great, the magnificent, the benevolent, and his holy prophet Muhammad, let's begin our course, you know. And I and the students kind of snicker when I say that. And I said, but I hope since we're in more of a Christian demographic, you know, with all of you coming from probably more, we're in the South, evangelical backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want me, if you're taking my Jesus course, to come in the first day and open my New Testament and say, let's now study the inspired word of our Lord Jesus Christ, our precious Savior? Or would you raise your hand and say, Professor Tabor, I thought this was more like a, you know, an academic course studying Christianity. I didn't know you were going to kind of uh, not necessarily proselytize, but approach it that way, as it's not Bible study in that sense. So whenever I'm, I do interviews, there's a certain dilemma because it's public and anybody has the right to ask, you know, do you mind talking about your own faith? And in certain quarters, I, I do that. You know, I'm easy to find out there on YouTube and so forth. So I do that sometimes. But um, I uh, also always want to preserve the academic's hat, so to speak, of a kind of objective, descriptive, historical mm -hmm. approach. And I'm not a fundamentalist on any of the religions. Um, no. And therefore... Uh, somebody once said, I wish, I don't know who orig originated, but I love, I love the phrase. It's uh, in order to have Western fundamentalism, at least, you need a book, you know, whatever your book is. And then you need to say that that book has no mistakes. And then you need to begin to interpret it literally. And then you've got a, a fundamentalism. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Most of us who have higher education and begin to, you know, delve into texts and different manuscripts and comparing things and dating materials and so forth, we 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 quickly give that up. You know, Bart Ehrman, we mentioned, uh, he tells everybody he started as a mm. <laughs> evangelical Christian, and then somebody told him, "Oh, there's different copies of the New Testament that that." The changes are not what you've always been told. Just these little spelling. There's actually mm. some really significant things here and there where battles are being fought about theology. Mm. And, you know, that was his first step, um, I guess, in graduate school to begin to explore some of those things. Yeah, yeah I bet it's a fascinating biography uh, of his life. Um, okay. So my blog, the best way to keep up with me is it's it's easy, jamestabor.com. Right. It's, that's the blog. It's called Thank Tabor you. Blog. And I write about all sorts of things, mostly biblically oriented in general. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got a lot of things uh, in mind for the coming year. COVID's been tough mm -hmm. for all of us. Uh, I haven't posted as often as I have in the past, just dealing with various things and 
uh, everything's been harder for everybody but yeah, yeah. well um, i'm sure people want to uh visit that uh website as i will and um maybe this is a good time to uh draw our fascinating conversation to a close and thank you uh again to you dr james d table for your time your generosity and sharing uh your thoughts and my my questions and uh it's been absolutely fascinating and um uh, I, I just finally thank you again and um anything finally you want to say or before we wrap it up um, oh, thank you paul for uh having me as your guest i i've listened to several of the programs that your assistant uh, gave me some links where i could begin to see what you're doing it's very impressive thank you if you can ever get um uh dale allison you had dale martin do you know dale allison i i i'm just uh this is one of my favorite books of all time actually oh yeah, yeah. it's a historical christ and the theological G uh jesus yeah. absolutely fascinating well, allison has a new book on the resurrection i just got it yeah, last I, week it's yeah, blowing my mind uh his honesty his uh exactly exactly i find that dale allison he also has this book very on, nice night comes let's see death imagination and the last things he talks about a car accident he was in oh, you know gosh. he's very personal he's at the age i think he's in his 60s he's he's unveiling himself and i found his books on jesus for years in the gospels yeah, yeah. to just represent the finest kind of approach to new testament studies just unbelievably thorough and meticulous I think he's respected by all quarters. Yes. This new book on the resurrection that I've got, you, you, you probably have it. Uh, it's called uh, The Resurrection of Jesus, Apologetics, Polemics, and History. Not that one. I've got his book, uh, Resurrecting Jesus. There's another book on the resurrected Jesus. Yeah. So this is a now new this one. This just came uh, out. It's 2021. And ah, no, I've not got that. I didn't know it existed. Uh, Get that. Yeah, I, this is what I'm going to read as soon as I finish grading exams this week. Uh, and oh, I just you know, that. I I respect it. him so much. His his little yeah. book, you know, he, let's see, it's called Jesus of Nazareth. The uh, it, it was the millennial something about the was it the millennial prophet? Let's see. Oh, uh, this one, yeah, millenarian prophet. Right. I oh, know he's done a number of books, but this yeah. one I really, this is kind of his turn of the century, turn of the millennium, Jesus book. Yes. And boy, it is, it is really clear yes. and nice. He yeah, he's struggled it. himself, you know, with, oh, with all of these issues on a very personal level. And Interesting. Because uh, in, in a much smaller way, I, I have done exactly that. That's why I went to university in the first place, because these, these questions were burning away and I wanted answers. But in, yeah. in finding answers, of course, it changes you and you have different perspectives opening up. And, uh, well, get you know, Droge's uh, Quran and see what you think of it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to email you an article that Droge sent me uh, called Trans. It's about translating the Quran, where he explains... Wow the different philosophies of translation and why he thinks many of them are, are inadequate. Mm. And uh, I think you'll find it really interesting. I wrote a book with Arthur called A Noble Death. It was, uh, mm. I guess it was my first book after the dissertation, Suicide and Martyrdom in the Ancient World. And Harper published it, a major trade book. And uh, that was my beginning. So we co-authored a book, and he went to Chicago with me. So he's, he's a little few years behind me. And we both studied with this wonderful teacher, Jonathan Z. Smith, who's a historian of religions, legendary, wonderful, passed away a couple of years ago. But Arthur's amazing. Um, he's not an Islamicist. He just got intrigued with Islam. And I said, mm -hmm. Arthur, how can you translate the Quran? You, you know, your field is early Christianity. He has the same doctorate I do. And he said, I just spent five years studying uh, Arabic. Wow. And it's classical Arabic. And you can master it to a degree, you know, in terms of the linguistic and the grammar. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that all the translations are just horrible. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I needed to uh, do a translation where people could get a sense of what the Quran actually says. So. Amazing, amazing. I think you'll find it just, you won't be able to put it down because of all the, it's the notes. The right. notes are just amazing. So. Oh, excellent. I look forward to uh, reading about that. Yep. 
Okay. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, James, uh, for your time once more. And um, will we be in touch? I'm just going to end the broadcast here. Thank you. Okay.